Welcome. These audio recordings by W. Cleon Skousen were recorded in 1973 and 74 by students Roy and Rexine Robbins while attending Brother Skousen's religion classes at Brigham Young University. We are indebted to Roy and Rexine for their time and effort to record these lectures and make them available. Although the quality of these recordings are not professional, we feel they are very adequate for your listening and learning experience. We have digitally enhanced the original recordings to bring you the best quality possible. This series of 37 classroom lectures will bring you to the conclusion of 3rd Nephi and include an inspiring explanation of the Sermon on the Mount as the Lord presented it to both the Jews in Jerusalem and the Nephites in America. The remaining classroom lectures on the Book of Mormon were covered during the last semester of that year at BYU and apparently were not recorded. While teaching these lessons on the Book of Mormon, Brother Skousen was also writing and compiling his student textbook, Treasures from the Book of Mormon. This four-volume series is still in print and available. This course enhances the study of the Book of Mormon by using a fill-in-the-blank method which embeds into the mind key words located in each verse of the Book of Mormon. Also now available are the Treasures from the Book of Mormon audio commentary. This series of recordings were produced by Brother Skousen and Wendell Noble, and it provides a verse-by-verse commentary of the entire Book of Mormon. As Wendell Noble reads each verse of the Book of Mormon, Brother Skousen inserts his commentary and adds insight and understanding to the Book of Mormon. These materials, as well as many others by W. Cleon Skousen, can be found at our website, skousen2000.com. Now, we hope these live classroom recordings will help increase your testimony and help you better understand the gospel significance of this, a second witness of Jesus Christ. Here is Brother Skousen. Now then, how many have not been able to get books yet? Quite a few of you. Now, they were delivered this morning at 8 o'clock, and so they should be available after this class any time during the day. They also have a quantity of them at the Freeman Institute just down below the Health Center at 839 North 700 East. So everybody should have them now. And you'll notice at the end of the introduction there are 20, 15 questions, and you hand those in now just as soon as you can get them done, uh, because that's the introduction to the Book of Mormon. That's what tells you what was going on when Nephi was a baby and uh, how many things he knew about and terrible wars just happened the very year the Book of Mormon opens up. So that introduction is tremendously important for many reasons, not just Book of Mormon, but to help you in all your ancient history and so forth. Now, I've also asked you to get the, um, uh, the $2 student manual, which I call textbook number two. Now, in my class, I'll say textbook three, textbook two. Will you get to keep that straight? Textbook one is what? Book of Mormon. Textbook two is the topical study that all the church students are studying. Textbook number three is the one that's exclusively in this class. It's the only class in the whole church that's studying it. It's the experimental course that you're part of. And uh, this is for those students who really want the Book of Mormon in depth. And uh, so for those of you who don't have your book, you'll be able to get them today for sure. Now, how many do I have sitting in the class now who are not yet signed up for it? About how many? Now, as of this morning, it looks real good. Uh, We apparently have had some who knew that their course was too heavy for this one, and so I see a number of empty seats. That's a real good sign. So for those of you who, if you'll be here Tuesday, go ahead and get your book. I think we'll be able to work all of you in okay. Uh, Now... I want to just stress again our procedure in the class. Your first assignment, which is the introduction in your text, has the 15 questions that you are to answer and hand in. And the answers are only very brief one and two words usually. 
They're not long answers, but I want you to hand those in and um, either write in your book or keep a um, uh, copy of them for yourself because this part always figures in the first examination. You'll be asked several things about it um, because it's, it's just worthwhile to know. And then um, beginning with Tuesday, you'll be handing in the, uh, the next assignment and you'll hand me in a little certificate which says, my name is so-and-so, and you're the off section so-and-so, and I have now completed up to page so-and-so. And I certified this was my work. Then you sign your name. And that's just to keep reminding us we're on the honor code and we get under pressure, you know, and got a physics exam coming up and a girlfriend says, you want me to hand that in for you and so forth? And, and that's when Lucifer says, yeah, let her do it. And there's the honor code. Yeah, but you know, you're under pressure. And you have a big debate going, a big dialogue goes on in your mind. And that's where you gradually learn whether or not you're honor code quality yet. Because we'll have an occasional casualty. Two of my students, they lost their credit. They were suspended last spring. I felt so terrible about it. Uh, because they had uh, handed in work that wasn't their own. And in the, in the, under the honor code... Um, we have our free agency. There, there are some penalties that go with violations, and I felt real badly about that. But other students knew of their problem, and for their own sakes, they didn't turn them in as stool pigeons. They just knew they were cheating themselves, and they were good friends. And they said, Why do, can't you just uh, call this to their attention? But when it was called to their attention, it was found that it was a lot more complicated than just the that violation of the honor code. So anyway, there were some problems. So right here while you're fresh and uh, you have no uh, s scores against you, just simply say, I am of honor code quality and I will prove it to myself. You don't have to prove it to me. I will prove it to myself, my Heavenly Father. So next Tuesday, you'll be certifying how far you have gotten. So try and get caught up over the weekend so that we're all together. And I'm going to make it easy for you this morning because I'm going to cover much of the territory. I mentioned to you the last uh, hour that we found out that Joseph Smith was being expected by the Jews. Do you remember that? Joseph Klausner wrote his book called The Messianic Idea in Israel and devoted the ninth chapter in this college text of Hebrew University to Joseph Smith without knowing it was Joseph Smith. He just said, we know that before the Jewish Messiah comes, a descendant of Joseph must rise up and commence the gathering of Israel, call all people to repentance, including the Jews, establish the true law, and in the process the tradition says he will be killed. Is this tradition accurate? Is it accurate? It's right on target. And Dr. Klausner said, now we're kind of astonished that we don't um, have this in our Old Testament anywhere. And when Joseph Smith was doing the inspired version, lo and behold, it all comes up in the 50th chapter of Genesis. And that must have been a, a strange feeling for Joseph Smith as the Lord told him how Moses originally wrote the 50th chapter of Genesis and he is part of it. And all of that had been stripped out. So had the material about their going into slavery and the material about Joseph knowing about Moses, who would be uh, actually his grandnephew. He knew him by name. He knew his brother's name, Aaron. He knew about the dividing of the Red Sea. He knew that they would come out after many miracles. And that's why he said to the people, take my body with you. I wanted him bombed like I embalmed my father's body. Take my body out with you. And they did. Some... Um, 200 and, um, well, almost 200 years after Joseph's life. So <clears throat> all this is coming alive. With the restoration of the gospel came vast quantities of new knowledge, which nobody could test in the beginning, but which science and other things have tested uh, empirically since. And, and as Brother Nibley says, the evidence is just pouring in and pretty soon you won't even be able to get credit for accepting this book on faith anymore because it's just obvious that it's, that it's true. Meanwhile, you test it by reading the book and the Lord says, the best test of all, let me, te let me talk to you through the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you it's true. I'll tell you it's true. And so you, you'll find that as you're studying it this year. You keep saying, Heavenly Father, is it, was it really this way? And the Spirit will keep warming and warming. And 
One of my students said in the spring, Brother Skousen, I'm not an emotional person, but when I'm studying this course, for the first time in my life, the Spirit comes to me so strong that the wellsprings kind of spill over. And I said, well, don't be embarrassed about it. This happens to all of us. This is part of our spiritual maturity. This is really a great book. Now, take a few notes here. In your textbook number two, there are listed a number of reasons why we should be very well acquainted with this book. And number one, the number one reason is because it, it has been approved by God. In other words, he says in the Doctrine and Covenants, this is the book I want you to understand because in it are the doctrines that you need to know for the latter days. And it's approved by him. He says it is the truth and it is necessary to understand it. That's Doctrine and Covenants 17 and 6 and 19 and 26. Number two, he says the saints are under condemnation if they treat it lightly. I might like to hear it. Did I read this to you last time? Section 84, verses 57, or excuse me, uh, 84, verses 54 up to 57. Listen. See, the, this is two years after the church has been restored. And he's talking to the returned missionaries. They just came off their missions. Oh, they had such a wonderful time. Uh, they, they were out there, and people said, What's the news? Oh, great. God has spoken again. Prophets are back on the earth. We're receiving all kinds of new material. We found out all about the scattering of Israel and that some of them ended up on this continent. Just thrilling. It's great. It's been restored. Well, and then what else, what else happened? What... Uh, what are the details? Well, it's just great. The gospel's restored. I know, but what was restored? Well, it's wonderful. <laughs> you see? So here's what the Lord says. And your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief. You know, if you don't know what to believe that's true, you've got unbelief there. And because you've treated lightly the things you have received. Which vanity, the egotism of thinking, you know, I know all about it. I, I got this thing down. Which vanity and unbelief has brought the whole church under condemnation? And this condemnation resteth upon all the children of Zion. And they shall remain under condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant of my Book of Mormon and the other commandments which I have given. And we're still under that condemnation. President Lee says, Let this generation be the one that removes the cloud. And let us now work for the day when we can receive the other two-thirds of the Book of Mormon plates. We only got a third. The Lord says, I'll test you with those. And if you'll just appreciate what I've given you and understand it, I'll give you the other two-thirds. Isn't that great? All right, now there's another reason we ought to know it. Number three, this is God's great witness for the last latter days. Took him a couple of thousand years to get it put together and preserved. This is his great witness for the latter days. And that's the um, preface to the Book of Mormon. This is my witness to the Jews, to the Gentiles, and to all Israel that Jesus is the Christ and that the earth is being prepared for the second coming. This is his great witness. It's just full of it. All right, that's the preface to the Book of Mormon. It's the opening part. And four, we will be judged out of the things that are written in this book because we had access to it. Second Nephi, 25 and 22. Did you get that one? Second Nephi, 25 and 22. Okay. Number five, it contains the formula for escaping the calamities of the last days. And they're coming. And they're in the 45th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. They're described in the 88th uh, um, section of the Doctrine and Covenants, 21st chapter of 3rd Nephi, and so forth. We'll be covering these a little later on. But the, read, just put down your notes, Ether 2 and 11. 
that this is the book by which we may know how to escape the calamities of the latter days. And President Lee recently said, one of the ways is to gather with the saints. And that doesn't mean gather in Salt Lake City or in Provo where real estate is already sky high. That means gathering with the saints wherever the saints gather because you may be asked to move. And if you're not gathering with the saints, you won't even hear the prophet's message. That's what happened to a lot of the saints in the days of Nauvoo. They woke up and the church was out in the mountains. And they just never got around to joining us. And we're going back now, the fifth generation into Illinois and Indiana and picking up their great-great-great-grandchildren who talk about great-great-great-grandpa who was a Mormon. Where was he? He wasn't gathered with the saints. So when they got the signal to move, he didn't move. And all of their children left the, uh, left the church. So this book tells you how to escape the calamities of the latter days. And number six, it will feed the spirit. It will feed your spirit. Now, when I was taking philosophy in college, I got uh, some professors whom I admired confusing me just a little bit, and I mentioned it to my father. Oh, he said, no problem, no problem. Uh, the, the, the precepts of men, some of them are brilliant, but many of them will confuse you. Only the precepts of men inspired by the Holy Ghost will stand up under scrutiny. So if you feel confusion, that's the spirit of the adversary. Now you flip the Book of Mormon open, read it for 30 minutes by the clock, and say, Heavenly Father, let me have your spirit of enlightenment. Watch what happens to you. It just won't even matter, especially after you've had this class where you flip it open, because it might be talking about uh, Alma the Younger and, uh, um, uh, and his war with Malachi or somebody. Uh, uh, it just won't matter whether it's war or prophecy or scripture. You'll find this book just breathing a tremendous, wonderful, soothing spirit. Now, you'll bear witness of that with me a little later on if you can't do it already. Let me just tell you something. When the brethren asked me to write a text on the Book of Mormon several years ago, they said, try and do for the saints what the Thousand Years series did. It awakened them. It made the prophets come alive. And you did that for the Old Testament. Now see if you can write something up for the Book of Mormon. Oh, I, I was thrilled with the assignment. So I go to work. I wrote, and I wrote. I filled waste baskets full of paper. And nothing productive. And you know why? I couldn't get the Spirit of the Lord to help me like it did with the Old Testament writing. I was trying to do it the same way. And I would become so frustrated, and I'd leave it for a couple of weeks. I'd go back. I'd try to write. It was just blah. It even bored me. And um, finally I said to my wife, there's something wrong. I'm not getting any help. She said, well, let's have fasting and prayer and see if we can get some help. So we did, and nothing came immediately. But one night I was sitting, preparing the material, and all of a sudden the impression came press the student back into the Book of Mormon. Press the student back into the Book of Mormon. Well, how do you write a text that takes a person away from the Book of Mormon and yet press him back into the Book of Mormon? How do you do that? So I thought about it and I thought about it. And, and about six weeks later, I read a study of, on, on programmed learning. <clears throat> which is a way of digesting material out of a book so the student makes certain that he gets the meat. It used to be used extensively. Then it was abandoned by the pro progressive education people. And um, they said facts weren't important if you just learn how to think. And I thought about that. How do you learn how to think without tools? Now, 2 plus 2 is e equals 7, doesn't it? You see, you've got the tools to immediately know I'm telling you a lie. Two plus two is not seven. How about 49 times 49? 5,381, right? Right? Right. Right. Write it down. It's a lie. You see, you have no vehicle by which to test me unless you sit down and work it out. But you do have the tools to work it out. You eventually would catch up with me. It's a lie. It's about twice as much as the real answer. Okay, to do correct thinking, you must have the correct tools. Therefore, the Spirit seemed to say, 
press the student back into the Book of Mormon, programmed learning. I started this, and the spirit was glorious. Uh, it, it, uh, you wouldn't be, believe, unless you'd been right there with me, how, uh, how scintillating, intellectually scintillating, the spirit can make you once you get on the right format. And that's how this was written. And my mind would be reminded of things very obscure and remote, things I hadn't thought about for 30 years. Things that were way up in the Book of Mormon yet. And after I got way up in the Book of Mormon, the mind would scintillate on things that were way back. And I can testify to you that the Holy Ghost does bring to your remembrance the things that ought to be said. And I dug back in my files things I hadn't seen since I was in college, taking uh, archaeology or something that came to my, my mind. I hadn't even thought about it for 30 years. And it just fitted in beautifully. I dug it up and got the more recent up-to-date material, put it in the book. So anyway, this book presses you back into the Book of Mormon. Uh, that's what it's designed to do. And while you're reading the Book of Mormon, see the Spirit, it won't be in this book. This is what you'll notice. The intellectual information is here. The Spirit of God that says, this is my word. This is true. Do the things in this book. That you'll find when you read the Book of Mormon itself. What this text does is to press you back into the Book of Mormon to read it more carefully. Now see, it's loaded with hidden treasures. For example, um, Jesus said, except you're born of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You want your children with you in heaven? See, it meant baptism, didn't it? You want your babies and children with you in heaven? Sure you do. So, shall we baptize them? It isn't clear in the Bible. It is in the Book of Mormon. No, you don't have to baptize them until after they're eight years of age. But why? It says, except you're born of the water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Answers in the Book of Mormon. Oh, that's the reason. Beautiful. I'm not going to give you the reason now. We're going to come to it later. Among the Old Testament prophets, you had the Lord saying to a man and his wife, I want you to have other families, multiple families. All the patriarchs and prophets were required to do it. Have numerous families, not just one. Father Jacob, four families. Why does the Lord command it sometimes and call it an abomination the other? Sometimes he says you must do it, and other times he says you must not do it. It's wrong. Why? It isn't in the Bible. All you've got there is the historical fact that they did it sometimes and sometimes they didn't. In the Book of Mormon, it'll tell you when it needs to be done and why God commands it and why it's an abomination any other time. That's a pretty that's worthwhile knowing. Uh, all the folks down at, uh, what's that creek down in, uh, I think it's Colorado, yeah, Short Creek. You see, they, they ought to read their Book of Mormon more carefully. It's all there. They just couldn't comprehend that. We've got a lot of our people confused on that doctrine. Well, I could go along here about 15, 20 doctrines. In fact, almost, uh, I've got 300 listed. Exclusively in the Book of Mormon. Referred to in the Bible, but no explanation. This is a tremendous book. Well, President Lee says, and I close now on this part, it is not sufficient to teach the gospel so it can be understood. It is not enough to teach the gospel so it can be understood. It is necessary to teach it so plainly it cannot be misunderstood. Now that hit me like a bombshell because in my classes I go fast. I go too fast. And every once in a while I'll have a student come up and say, Brother Skousen, did you mean so and so? And I'll say, no, of course not. You were, didn't I say so and so? Oh, yes, yes you did. So obviously you, you jumped to the wrong conclusion. Oh, yeah, I guess I did. All right. I'm going too fast. Don't you let me go too fast. I must not leave room for misunderstanding. Will you help me that way? You are the criteria of whether or not I'm doing a good teaching job, not me. The fact that I put it out isn't sufficient. It must register clearly in your mind. And if it hasn't, please call it to my attention. President Lee is right. I must set these doctrines forth sufficiently slow and careful that you won't misunderstand. And if you do misunderstand, you tell me if I haven't made it clear. All right, now, the reason I go fast 
is because, number one, I, <clears throat> I love the gospel, and I found out so many things about it, I don't have time to share it all. And uh, you see, uh, I'm uh, getting along in life, and might be terrible to take any of these secrets away. You know, I've got to share them all. Well, I found out as I've matured that what I don't tell you, the Lord will. Because a lot of things nobody told me. I found the Spirit whispered to me as I went through the scriptures. This is what that means. It does? Yeah, it does. Wow, that's exciting. Now, one day I was, when I was 14, my grandfather was stake president in Old Mexico, and I was sitting under a tree with him, and he said, you know, Cleon, you're not going to hear all the gospel the way I heard it. And I said, why not? He said, we're not teaching it anymore. A lot of wonderful truths are being lost because we just don't talk about it anymore. Oh, I said, Grandpa, um, good, goodness sakes, you t better tell me. I don't want to miss anything in case you go. <laughs> And he said, well, you're not old enough. I'd like to share it with you, but you're really not old enough. But he said, I'll give you some advice. You read the scriptures very prayerfully, and maybe the Spirit will alert you to some of the lost doctrines. And you know what? It not only will alert you, but you'll be reading along in the writings of the brethren, and there it was all the time. They had it. But it wasn't discussed among the church. And in this text here we have about, oh, I'd say 15 or 20 lost doctrines from the church. And your roommate, when you say, did you know that it's the teaching of the church thus and so? Oh, no, I've been in the church all my life. I never heard that. <laughs> that must be a Scousenism. Or you know, something. No, it's one of the lost doctrines. And Brother Widso, I was 17 when I went on my mission. I served under Brother Widso, an apostle of the church. He just got my mind stimulated and going like radar beams because he told me about some of these lost doctrines. And they were so faith-promoting, they made so much sense. I was a pre-med student a little later on. I had that kind of a mind. I wanted to have things rational. I knew God was rational. He doesn't do things that are unreasonable. And it looked like a lot of unreasonable things had happened, frankly. And Brother Witzow started to tell me what had been going on. And it was exciting. So... Um, I just learned that in this gospel there is so much that you won't ever be able to share it all. So if I try to share too much with you too fast, stop me. At the moment you become confused, I am violating President Lee's instructions. So you stop me so I won't commit a sin, will you? No, I want to teach it plainly. All right, now. I have time now to give you about 2,000 years of world history. So now if you'll just kind of draw a line, and I'm going to take this now out of the introduction of your n number three volume, which is the one I'm talking about here. To do that, I have to have a screen. In your introduction, it says the first date you are to memorize is 4,000 B.C. What does that represent? Is that the creation of Adam? No. What is it? Beginning of human history, which is the fall of Adam. Okay. The next the main date, which isn't in your book, which, but which you should remember, is just 500 years later. 3500 B.C. is the century that belongs to Enoch and is the next dispensation. 3500 B.C. That's Enoch. And after Enoch was translated, the next great prophet, of course, and the next great dispensation was Noah. Now that date is in your book. And I want to give it to you so you'll never forget it. So if you write in your notes, one, two, three, four, four. Okay? One, two, three, four, four. Write down that date. Now, now put a line through the one. Because this is the great number one flood. You see, there have been several floods. No, none like this one. Oh, boy, this was the super flood. This was the colossal universal flood. The number one flood was 2344 B.C. Isn't that interesting? Now, you, you, be sure and remember that because it's on the examination. So you just write 1, 2, 3, 4, 4. Just hick a little bit, you see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 4. And you got it. And cross out the one. You will never forget this in all your life. Now, we know that this is the date because we can trace it from father to son, the actual age of each one, down to the date of the flood. We're right on for the date of the flood. Now, a little later on, some Old Testament chronology is a little obscure. But at this point, we got a date. We can put our finger right on. And it's um, the number one flood was 
2, 3, 4, 4 B.C. Okay? Now, after the flood, the ark landed at Mount Ararat, A-R-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-R-A-T. -A -R -A -R -A -A and came, the mountain is right up there. It's the tallest mountain up here, the Armenian mountains right up here. Everybody's called it the mountain of Ararat from the most ancient times. Josephus talks about it, 90 A.D. He said, we've been up there, we've seen the ruins of the ark. Anybody who doesn't believe the Jewish story of the flood, go up and look at the ark. It's up there. Uh, it was seen by Marco Polo. It was seen uh, every century by three or four people. In 1938, uh, one of the British spies wandered across those mountains trying to escape from the Nazis. He saw it, thought it was a fortress up there. But, and, and he could just see some of the timbers and so forth. Well, now you can't see it because it's under about uh, uh, 15 feet of ice. Uh, but 1938 was a warm spell, and some of it got exposed. Now, through the ice, you can photograph some of the timbers. They're 140 feet long. They're broken loose off the ark. 140 feet long. You notice how long that, that is? 140 feet? It's a lot longer than this room by twice. And you can photograph them through the ice. Now, they've been trying to get up there to actually get into it to see if this could have been the ark. And Dr. Crawford, who's doing it, is a very good friend of ours, going to be visiting with us shortly. And he has told us that the last uh, two summers ago, they were up there. They had the uh, Michigan State uh, chemists with them. They have a new method of melting ice fast. But the Russian government came with helicopters and forced them off. It's on Turkish territory, but it looks right down on Russian territory. And Turkey is very beholden to Russia. So the Russians came up and threatened to machine gun them if they didn't get off, so they got off. Uh, now they have permission, they think now, to go up again, and uh, maybe we'll see. We, they brought all their movies back, and we showed them to President Joseph Fielding Smith, and after it was over, he said, well, gentlemen, uh, don't be surprised if it turns out to be the Ark. There was one, you know. <laughs> right on. All right, now, when was the flood? Two... 3, 4, 4 B.C., okay? They came down from that mountain, which is about 13,500 feet where that structure is, if it turns out to be the ark. There are no trees around there for hundreds of miles. Nothing but rock, no reason to build a building up, up there. People thought it was a fortress. Why have a fortress up there? Anyway, there's a building up there. There's a structure with lots of rooms in it. And all the ancients say that it was the ark. So we've got to check on it. They came down then and settled in the land of the east, which we think was Persia. And then a descendant of Ham, after about four generations, says, you know, we don't want to be sheep herders all our life. Let's build one of the big cities like they used to have in the old days, like they described before the flood. That sounds pretty great. I'd like to have build a city. Well, the prophet said, Shem said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Stay spread out. Spread out abroad across the earth. Now Nimrod says, come on, let's go over to the luscious, luxurious, tropical, lovely territory in the land of Shinar between the two rivers. One they named Euphrates and the other one Tigris. They called it Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the water. <clears throat> so they came over here and uh, they built four, several very great cities. One was Ur. This is called Chaldees. And up here is Babylon. Up here is the capital city of Nineveh. They had another couple along in here. They built these big cities. And they built their Tower of Babel. And the Lord warned them, I told you to spread out. And if you don't do it, I'm going to change your languages and force you to do it. And it will be a penalty. You won't even be able to talk to one another from one family to the other. If you don't spread out, you're becoming very corrupt and wicked with this urban life. And so that's when the Jaredite, uh, Mahanrai Mori Anchorman, his brother Jared, said to the Lord, please, can we, um, can we keep the language? Damic tongue, you see. Beautiful language. More, Moroni, as he's translating it, says, this is powerful. If, you're, if you feel like weeping, you can write in the Adamic tongue and make people weep. If you feel like laughing, you write in the Adamic tongue and they all burst out laughing. It's a marvelous, powerful language. And it's very brief. You can write it and fast people can talk. And so the Lord said, all right, I'll take you to another land and you can keep the language. And they turn out to be the Jaredites in the last part of the Book of Mormon. All the rest received the gift of tongues. Woke up one morning and can't understand the other family. Each family can understand itself and nobody else. So they were spread all over the planet. Some went over to the Yellow River in China 
and they immediately they have a very advanced civilization. I've seen a lot of their metallurgy and so forth. The same identical metallurgy is in, in the Indus River and, and the Nile and right along here in Mesopotamia. They all spring up about 2100 BC. They don't evolve. All archaeologists will tell you all of a sudden there they are. They got language, they got metallurgy, they're very advanced civilizations. There they are. All fits the Bible. Now, there was a large branch of the chosen people, descendants of Shem, who went along too. We're not just sure when they went. Uh, Shem apparently didn't go, neither did Noah. But uh, descendants of Shem did, and they ended up over here. Right here. Just across the river, it isn't very far, but they're over here. They're in the Chaldees. By the tenth generation down from Noah, you have a young fellow born to a very wealthy local citizen of Ur whose name is Abram. And as he grows up, he watches his father sacrifice his brothers and sisters in human sacrifices. He hears about a very wonderful person whom God loves and who holds the great and holy priesthood that Adam held. Uh, and he's a king over here in a city called Salem. Salem, which means peace. Shalom. Salem. Shalom, Salem. And it afterwards was occupied by the Jebusites and it became known as Jebusalem, the city of peace of the Jebusite tribes, or Jebusalem, or Jerusalem, became Jerusalem. All right, Abraham heard about it, and he's a young man. He says, I want to be like him. His name is Melchizedek. I want to be like him. 84th section of the Doctrine and Covenant says he went over and got the priesthood from him before he had even married, while he was still a young man. He's so happy to have the priesthood, he says. And... Um, he got it from Melchizedek. Well, when he was um, a little later than that, the Lord called him to be a prophet. He warned all these people. They had a terrible famine. They tried to sacrifice Abraham in a human sacrifice, his own father cooperating. And finally, the Lord said, Now leave, Abraham. Uh, your brother has died. I want, I want you to marry uh, one of his daughters, uh, Sarah, and depart. And his father tagged along. He said, if you're going to escape the famine, I want to go. So anyway, they went up here, and he stayed at Haran that he named after his dead brother until he was 62. The Bible says 75, but it actually was 62. Uh, somebody got mixed up. He arrived over here at 75. At 62, he departed here, thinking he was going to go down here and live, but he didn't. He was told to go on down into Egypt, and just before he went down, God told him a most magnificent revelation, or gave him a magnificent revelation, about our whole galaxy. He saw the great central dynamo called Kolob. He saw all of the suns around suns around suns around suns. It gets out to our sun, which is about nine out. We're about 37,000 light years out from Kolob. 37,000 light years. And he saw all of that, then he was given the mathematical formula and so forth, the distances is all of them. And then the Lord says, now teach this to the Egyptians. And Abraham says, and I also taught them the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he was coming. So the Egyptians knew about the Messiah. He says, they were not allowed to have the priesthood, and so God told me to teach them because he loved them too. And they were a righteous people. They were trying to be a righteous people, but they just didn't have enough light. So the Lord told me to teach them, and I taught them. Then he came back and settled here when he was 75. Then the Lord says, now your descendants are going to go in, in, back into Egypt and they'll be in slavery. And that then happened uh, 1700 B.C. So now, let me give you another couple of dates. We're getting behind. For Abraham, the century is 2000. Right, 2000 B.C., Abraham. And then he had a son when he was 100, believe it or not, uh, who was named Isaac. So what century belongs to Isaac? 1900, obviously. That's just like 2 plus 2. See what good thinkers you are when you have the tools? All right. And then um, Isaac, in turn, had a son. In fact, he had two, one who became the ancestor uh, uh, of the Arabs, along with uh, one of Abraham's sons. And he had a son, and his name was Jacob. What century will belong to Jacob? 1800. Isn't that great? And then Jacob had 12 sons. He had 12 sons. And uh, his chosen son was his 11th son, it turned out to be. He had a lot of trouble with his children. But number 11 turned out to be the most valiant, and his name was Joseph. And probably every person in this room is a descendant of that man. Just fantastic how the Lord engineers things. And as you see the history of the descendants of this man, you'll find out how the younglings 
that settled uh, certain parts of Europe and Asia and uh, tips of islands and so forth. They're all descendants of this man. Fantastic. So what century belongs to Joseph? 1700. Isn't that it? it's nice for the Lord to kind of arrange it that way so his students could memorize it easy. Now, uh, Joseph um, had a brother whose name was Levi. And um, uh, in his old age, why, she, a daughter was born to him. And she had a son, and his name was Moses. Now, you see, we've hit two generations, haven't we? So which century is going to belong to Moses? 1500, you see. He's a grandson. Grandson. Moses is 1500. Then our great ancestor was the right-hand man of Moses, and his name was Joshua, and he's 1400. Now, I apologize to you. I looked at the clock, and it got ahead of us. I'll catch up with you next time. <laughs>